Okay, we're live. Welcome to another episode, episode 42 of Turf Chat, uh, bringing them back while we're in COVID crisis and lockdown in your home. Um, nobody here is from Wisconsin because otherwise they would be out running around uh, in the streets now after <laughs> Supreme Court ruling. Um, today we have uh, an awesome episode, I think, in terms of um, water quality and salinity and some issues that a lot of golf course superintendents are seeing. Um, we have three people here. We have Mike Huck, we have Jeff Beardsley, and we have Dr. Larry Stoll. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then I'll, I'll kind of set up the rules of how we're going to run this thing and then Mike's going to get us started. So Mike, why don't you introduce yourself first? Uh, Mike Huck, I'm a former golf course superintendent and was uh, with the USGA Green section for a number of years. I've been on my own doing independent consulting primarily with wastewater, water recycling uh, projects. I offer uh, agronomic support to the engineering firms a lot of times. That's about half my work, it seems like, that are doing the retrofits of golf courses, parks, recreation areas, things like that with water recycling projects. And I do some independent work with golf courses. I try and avoid the non-golf course business. It's not fun. Uh, so that's about it. I'm based in South Orange County, California. Okay. Jeff, why don't we send it over to you? Everybody, I think, is in California, right? Except for me. You all are all in California. Yes, I'm uh, yeah, Jeff Beersley, formerly, formerly of Big Canyon Country Club. I was uh, there for 25 years as a superintendent and uh, currently uh, seeking other um, opportunities at the moment. But um, I'm an East Coast transplant myself. Came out of the University of Massachusetts program back in the 80s and uh, relocated to California. So I've been uh, growing turf out here for over 30 years in, in California. Okay, I'm Larry Stoll. I'm with uh, Pace Turf in uh, San Diego, and uh, PaceTurf.org is a website you can take a look at. I hope uh, some of you will visit it. And uh, I'm back to uh, you, John. All right. Uh, so I am John Kaminsky. I'm a professor at Penn State in the Turf Grass Science Program. And Larry and several of us started these turf chats uh, several years ago, and they kind of just went away. Um, and we're trying to bring them back to see. Um, so we're recording these episodes. So if you're not watching live, um, you're missing out on being able to interact and ask questions, uh, but you'll still get a lot of great and useful information. Um, for those of you that are here live, I think that um, there's a few more popped in since uh, we last checked. Um, if you have a question, a comment, um, you can do so by uh, typing that in into the question and answer. Um, if you just have a, a comment, you can put it in the chat, um, but we'll try to get all those questions asked uh, or answered either during the presentation or, um, or when we wrap up and we have a little bit of discussion. So with that, I'm going to get right into it. Mike, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, John. Okay. All right. My screen should be up. Uh, <clears throat> everybody's pretty much familiar with the disease triangle. And I look at salinity problems as being kind of similar. If there's multiple influences and, uh, uh oh, we're froze. Uh oh, what the heck's going on? Oh, there we go. Uh, Got it. little delay. Uh, that there's actually, you know, kind of four areas of influence. So I've kind of renamed the disease triangle, the salinity quadrangle, uh, when you're starting to analyze uh, salt and water and uh, soil related problems that all come under the salinity banner near turf species too. And so I'm just going to talk briefly about the generalities here and show you a couple of problems I've run into. And then uh, Larry and, and Jeff are going to really dive in deep on a couple items. But uh, here we go. You know, obviously, salinity tolerance of the species you're working with has a big influence. And if you can modify that and uh, I know Jeff and Larry are going to discuss this a bit. Uh, you can be more successful with a poor quality water and perhaps not the optimum drainage of your soils. You can see I've highlighted and bolded, or I should say underlined and bolded the warm season species versus the cool season species. And they generally uh, rank a little bit better in, in uh, salinity tolerance than most of the cool season grasses. Uh, water quality guidelines, these are pretty universal. Uh, Larry has tweaked the one number I believe that I figured out was the ammonium values uh, based on some of his experiences. And I don't disagree with anything that he's changed there. The rest of them you're gonna find no matter if they're published by the Food and Ag Organization of United Nations or University of California. They, uh, they're all spot on the same numbers. 
the thing of interest really that people have a hard time grasping sometimes is that the interaction between the sodium absorption ratio, the SAR, and salinity changes with the amount of salt. And the higher the salt level, the less impact sodium has on water movement in the soil. But the higher salt level naturally, the more impact you're gonna have on plant stress. So you've gotta keep that in mind too. Uh, we don't have time to go into these in detail, so we're just gonna move along. And this slide is just to show that there is wide variability in different sources of water, regionally, statewide, even in localities. Uh, this doesn't show it exactly, but if you look at the difference of the EC and the uh, versus the TDS, now there's a relationship there uh, that they, they correspond by a factor of about 640 parts per million per one unit of uh, electrical conductivity. Uh, you can see that this groundwater over here in Arizona is not very nice and you'd much rather have perhaps even the recycled water. And often, I think recycled water gets a bad name a lot of times just because we only hear about the failures and not the successes and, and some of those challenges. But uh, from that standpoint, you know, I'd, I'd definitely much rather have any of these other sources as compared to this, uh, this Arizona groundwater. It's pretty nasty. One of the overlooked factors of managing salinity and uh, poor water quality in general is irrigation distribution uniformity. And if we look down here in the lower right corner, the area that's got uh, good efficiency and poor uniformity, the problem you get into is this area here, not only drought stress, but at, over time you get salt stress too because your salts tend to migrate to the bottom edge of the wetting front. Primarily your chlorides are gonna be down there and that's the bulk of your salt stress uh, is generated by them in a lot of cases. And so when you go to leach this area and this gets just to where you can't tolerate it, now you're overwatering these areas that are already getting enough to push the salt through the root zone slightly and they become a quagmire uh, just to get the salt pushed through. So ideally, we wanna optimize the distribution uniformity. It just makes our life a whole lot better or a whole lot easier when we're uh, managing salts and water, uh, both, both dry spots and wet spots and as far as uh, salt accumulation. And this is just a quick aerial photograph from Google Earth. This was a course up in the Santa Barbara area I was working with uh, doing an audit and I, was doing it back around 2012. Actually, it was 2012, I believe. And, and I talked to the superintendent. I said, uh, did you just change your nozzles in the last five years? Because I saw the nozzles were a new and upgraded version of what they would have been equipped with when the system went in the ground. And he said, yeah, how'd you know that? And I said, I could tell by Google Earth. And you can see the difference in the dry spots in this same fairway, as opposed to uh, a few years after he had changed that the nozzles, and they're both August stress periods. That brings us to soils, and I think soils are another overlooked commodity here. Uh, when you're using poor quality water, you've got to maintain both your physical and chemical properties. And all well, often we focus on the chemical properties, but we really probably would do as well or do better focusing on the physical properties and, and uh, making sure that we can maintain infiltration uh, maintain permeability and that internal drainage so that we can keep those salts moving down through the soil profile as they accumulate. And that's particularly important when we get into a long-term drought like we just came through a few years ago in Southern California because uh, we're not getting any help from Mother Nature. Uh, we, we have to do it all with the sprinkler system or we have to do the best job we can with the sprinkler system, which this was a case where I ran into that was kind of self-inflicted. This was a course that had been renovated about seven years ago. They rebuilt the entire golf course, new irrigation system. They sand capped the fairways and the sand cap is below this area here over in the lower left, below that gray layer. And what that gray layer is, is an imported soil that came with the sod from our uh, Coachella Valley area, the Palm Springs desert area. And it's a very fine texture. So they put a fine texture sand over a coarse texture sand and create a perched water table. And when we would put a salinity meter in here, 
we would get down and as soon as we broke through that layer, the numbers went from extremely high EC numbers down to next to nothing. Uh, so this picture is just a, a round three quarter inch plug because I could get a little more of the uh, sand cap material to show it uh, in a photograph as opposed to here where it all broke off when using a profile tool. But uh, most of their areas were the low lying areas that were collecting the water. And I, I assume a lot of that was just lateral surface drainage, pulling salts with it. And then it would uh, collect in some of these areas what didn't go down the drain. I know Larry has another uh, take on this and maybe we'll get time to talk about that. Um, Permeability and infiltration is really, really important. And we've come to the conclusion that it's ideal to have a minimum, a bare minimum of at least two tenths of an inch an hour to be able to manage salinity in some of your native soils and fairways. And that this is a photograph a superintendent kindly gave to me several years ago of a, a native soil here in Orange County, California, that uh, we had heavy rains that winter. He took a cup cutter out, took out the four inch plug, filled it with water after one inch of rain the prior day. And he monitored it for four days and it went down about an inch and a half. So he's got infiltration rates of less than 0 0.02 inches per hour. He was draining one point, you know, about 1.44 inches every four days as opposed to in 24 hours. That gives you an idea. I've told people that that is slower than very slow is what the problem is there. But ideally, we'd like to be above the slow and into the moderately slow minimum and anything greater than that makes your life a whole lot easier. And if you have one of these soils that just does not drain adequately, sometimes your last option is soil modification uh, by top dressing uh, over a long term. It's a tough sell to a membership because it is a 10 year program probably at the very least in my opinion, maybe even longer uh, when your growing season is short. Uh, don't forget drainage, but if you do put drainage in ahead of time, don't cover the drains otherwise you'll, you'll break, that, uh, break that ability to drain down into the next layer. I do want to give a plug for one last thing here, uh, Larry and uh, a superintendent up in Colorado and John did a turf chat episode on the NRCS soil mapping survey that's online. And there is a multitude of good and inter interesting information in there that you can make use of. They'll give you some of those infiltration rates, water holding capacities, things like that, that can be very helpful in scheduling your irrigation or at least having a starting point to schedule from. And uh, for this one, I was actually looking at the parent materials, the soils, because they were gonna be using a high sodium laden water and these Montmerlinitic clays that are outlined out here in the red and the kind of brownish color are very susceptible to sodium damage. So that's why I had pulled those up. I was interested in seeing that, but there's a whole ton of information there. And I recommend you guys go back and watch that, that turf chat if you haven't seen it already. And, uh, gain some knowledge there. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff and Larry and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Hi. There we go, unmuted. Uh, so, yeah, so I'll take you into take okay. you into some of the specifics about, uh, about Big Canyon and uh, the work that Larry and uh, I have done over the years there. Uh, Big Canyon's a coastal uh, climate golf course about three miles from the ocean in Newport Beach. Uh, private equity owned club, uh, very demanding membership. I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, we uh, went into uh, an agreement with the city and the county to, to convert our 100% part of the water golf course over to a recycled uh, irrigated golf course. And uh, what we ended up doing is a 90% uh, of the course became uh, recycled, where 14 fairways are irrigated with recycled water and uh, four fairways, grains and green surrounds are irrigated with potable water. So a lot of the data that Larry will show is you'll see the two distinctions there. Um, some of the challenges we had early on was uh, where we're tree-lined cool season turf golf course and uh, immediately the, the issues with the salinity and, and, and nitrates uh, became uh, became evident. We, we had to go through a period of time uh, to communicate to the membership 
um, the changes in playability and uh, what we would need to do to, uh, to counter that. And, and some of that was you know, top dressing program um, and became even more aggressive with resodding fairways. We had to convert from uh, the cool season turf over to Bermuda. And uh, that was uh, a multi-year and uh, you know, $25,000 per acre to, to convert fairways over to, to the Bermuda grass. And again, some of the data Larry will show the Bermuda grass was handling the, the salts much better than the, than the rye grass was. Let me know you want, when you want to switch slides. Sure, yep, go ahead. Okay, mine's going a little slow too. Yeah, yeah there's a fairway top dressing here. Um, we, in, we invested uh, some dollars into uh, the, the equipment and uh, putting down light, I'll say a light rate, it became a membership acceptable rate. Um, obviously there's a, there's a rate that you'd like to put down as a, as a superintendent, um, but uh, you've got to deal with the membership. And we, have, we went down with a, with a light rate every two weeks starting in, in July. Our, our growth season really gets going in July along the coast. And um, that's when it began our application. So every two weeks from July right through September, through about the end of September, we're putting down, a, um, you know, Total, we had, I think we put down 500 tons of, of sand on, on the course uh, this, this last summer, this previous summer. So, so Jeff, let me ask you a question. Uh, does that pretty much go in when you irrigate? So it's not so much on the surface or? And we are Tifway 2 fairways. And one of the issues with Tifway that I find, at least along the coast, is it bruises easy. Um, mm. So we, we took one fairway and, and, and drug it in real heavy to try to aggressively get that sand off the surface and water it in. And boy, it, it lit that fairway up. It was it was yellow for two to three weeks afterward, just from the bruising of the of the leaf. So I, at the end, I decided to just go with a little slightly lighter rate that I could water in pretty heavily that night, putting on you know close to half an inch of water to, to get it off the surface and get it down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can see here on it's one of our fairways. Uh, just that's that's already been uh, top dressed, so it's it's light enough that. It's not going to scratch the golfer's club in the morning, but uh, it's uh, pr pretty uniform. Yeah. Well, this was, uh, I, I think we threw this in here because uh, the, you can just sort of describe uh, the way the water contract allowed you to um, swap out to better quality water if you needed to. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting contract. There was uh, the city of Newport Beach um, provided the we actually purchased the water from the city and then the city received the water from the county. So the county is manufacturing this recycled water uh, called Green Acres Project um, about three miles away. So it's, 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 pipe, it's piped over to the, to the club and it comes in um, under pressure. So uh, it's, it's an item where I do not have, there's no pump station to maintain for, for the course. It was, it was actually wonderful from that aspect. But um, through the contract, we realized early on that uh, ability to, to manage the water quality and as the county set it up was was more goals it was a three-year goal to to try to achieve um, the desired water quality and if the parameters weren't met um, we were able to, to contact the city and have them actually switch us back over to potable to do a flush so we could uh, we could flush the entire golf course with potable water and and during some of the droughty years in 03 04 uh, we, we did uh, we did pull that um, section of the contract out and, and did, did some flushing yeah, and so this shows the potable being hooked up to the recycled purple pipe, right? Correct. Yeah, there's a swivel L there where you could you yeah. could swivel across and uh, go from the purple yeah. recycled back to the blue, which is a potable. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's where. Yeah, and what Jeff and this will pick up on some of this. So uh, Jeff is talking about how easily brews the um, the tiff. Which was it? Tiffway two. Tiffway two. Yeah, Tiffway two was. Uh, and this is, uh, many of you are familiar with the growth potential, but this is a, a based on temperature, average temperature by month, and the percent of expected growth under optimal conditions for cool season or warm season grasses. Blue is the cool season grass uh, expected uh, growth potential, and red is the warm season grass expected growth potential. And you can see that uh, the warm season grasses are only expected to get up to about 40% of their potential just because it doesn't have enough sunlight and heat uh, in, in that area. So you've got this uh, turf grass species that, that's being used because it tolerates salts and it doesn't have uh, problems with diseases like gray leaf spot, but it doesn't really want to grow there. And that's a common problem in uh, Southern California because we, we have to irrigate from sometimes six months of the year. So you need a variety that's tolerant to 
uh, soil salinity, but uh, they don't grow very well. That's, that's the big, that's a big catch. And that's why Kikuyu grass is frequently uh, a, a good invader. And what, what happened in this case was that we can expect, you know, uh, roughly to use a ma Bermuda to use a maximum of about 0.7 pounds of N per thousand square foot per month. Um, that's, that's total coming from organic, whatever. That's, that's under optimum conditions, 100% growth potential. It'll use about 0.7 pounds per month. And the water, uh, and this, this is, shows that how it adds up using that growth potential. So throughout the course of the year, this is basically how much N we'd expect Bermuda grass to use for a total of 1.6 pounds of N per thousand square foot per month. That's all it's going to need for the whole year uh, because it's growing in such a suboptimal condition. So what happens if you put recycled water on it that's coming in with uh, total nitrogen at, at 18, around 18 parts per million, even higher in some cases? Uh, well, it turns out uh, if you use about three acre feet of water uh, per acre per year, which is about the irrigation level used in uh, coastal Southern California, you can calculate the amount of nitrogen that will be delivered just in the irrigation water uh, during normal practices and maintenance, and it comes out to be 3.4 pounds of N per thousand. So you're talking about pretty much double the amount of nitrogen that uh, you want to have go on there. So, well, it's not going to, the turf's not going to use it, so it's going to go some way or it's going to accumulate. And um, one of the problems, of course, is that uh, ammonium, and, and a lot of this nitrogen came from ammonium nitrogen they used to sterilize uh, the water, ammonium chlorates, and the ammonium ions will adhere to or to the uh, absorb to the soil particles, the positively charged soil particles. So it slows the process of leaching. So it's hard to leach out the ammonium. Nitrification works pretty well, but it's still, you end up with an accumulation of nitrogen in the system. And so this is what uh, Jeff was talking about that we worked on together to uh, uh, monitor uh, soil nitrogen. This is nitrate nitrogen milligrams per kilogram. Top uh, four inches uh, cores pulled at the 150 yard mark on 14 fairways that were uh, treated with recycled water. And then the other four fairways with the domestic water. Um, we, so we pulled these cores on each fairway in the same area. So they're, they're reliable uh, temporal relationships that we're seeing here. And as you see, when we started out, it wasn't too bad. We're under this about, I'm putting 30 parts per million as being in the green zone, which that's probably okay for turf growth. That's equivalent to application of one pound of N per thousand square feet. And a pound of N per thousand square feet is a, is a pretty substantial amount of N. Uh, so that they're starting out a little bit on the high side, but uh, when it, uh, over a course of a couple of years with normal management practices, uh, it just zoomed up, you know, to almost five pounds of N per thousand square feet. And then Jeff, maybe you can describe what management changes you made uh, when yeah, you- Yeah, because we saw that early on, because we were a cool season turf in, in the rough and in fairways I mean, back in the, you know, the 99 through 2003, we really start, saw the issue with the, with the rye grass just crapping out for lack of better words. Um, come summertime with it, with that high nitrate level, gray leaf spot just, just took it, took it apart. And uh, the membership at that time said, okay, we, let's, let's, you know, re, re, resurface the fairways and go to 100% Bermuda grass. Um, so that was really our biggest management challenge was, was dealing with that, with the failure of the, of the rye grass. Yeah, and you you completely pulled out nitrogen, uh, supplemental nitrogen applications everywhere on the on the course. Correct. Yeah, with with the exception of when we were doing some some over when we did, began the overseeding, we had to get so we had something in there to get that going. But uh, other than that, yeah, we we pulled out our our nitrate uh, applications completely. Yeah, and then over here on the organic matter uh, accumulation, you saw that go up, and well, this is where you started cutting backing off on uh, backing off on the end app. Yep. Right. So things started coming down for soil nitrogen pretty well. And uh, organic matter started tracking down also, uh, but this is the area where you started uh, resurfacing. Then is that that's right? Correct. Yeah, that, that, that 05, which also translates with with some good um, heavy heavy rainfall we had those those uh, those winters. Right, right. Yeah, but then then the organic matter is manageable because you you basically ground we in. grounded into this. Yeah, we we just kept the use it. a rotor tiller. Yeah, the rotor tiller in eight inches, left the turf on there, and just rotor tilled it down good eight inches into the soil and. And, and lay it on top of that. But it takes some time to figure out how these things are happening, you know, over time. It's just kind of a, it's hard to, you can't really predict that easily. So this is just looking at the total salts. And, you know, as uh, Mike was saying that six decibel per meter is fine for 
um, for Bermuda grass. So never really got over the tolerance of Bermuda grass. It definitely blows out. You can see four decimus Bermuda, that's where your ryegrass is gonna blow out. So that's a problem, you know, uh, pretty consistently. And then sodium levels, uh, you know, Bermuda grasses will tolerate 800 parts per million without too much problem. We're down more around uh, 400 parts per million on some of the cool season grasses. So you can see that we're really exceeding uh, the tolerance of uh, a lot of them. And of course, you'd like to have uh, levels lower, but, uh, you know, typically uh, in arid areas like um, California, you see pretty substantial uh, sodium levels and percentage sodiums usually not uh, as not above 15%, usually somewhere above eight or nine percent, but uh, that doesn't really impact normal soil, normal sandy soils. Uh, in the cases of these clay soils, they're, they're a problem no matter, no matter what you do with, the, with sodium levels. So this just shows the rainfall. Let me just go back up here. In 2005, you can see this drop down here. And I think, Jeff, we were talking about this. This is a, uh, you suspect, is one of the leaching uh, domestic water applications. Correct, yeah, they're, they're the, they're the end of uh, 03, early 04. Yeah. Right, so that's what, if you use domestic water, the salt levels come back right to where the domestic water levels are. And then this is due to a uh, uh, few years of uh, heavy drought and then a uh, rainfall, but still didn't bring it down to the domestic uh, water levels. And that's these, uh, this year right here was the heavy rainfall year coming in about uh, almost two feet of, uh, of uh, rainfall. And that, right. that will leach the salts down. And that gets back to some of the issues that, that Mike's talking about also, is that if you have uh, soils that will move water then rainfall will will fix them up pretty good, but uh, it's hard in the other in the, if you can't move any water at all. This was just an example that we were looking at looking at the roughs. Uh, this is rating quality uh, as five, four, three, two, and one, almost pretty much dead. And on the right hand graph, we're looking at turf that same turf quality rating. Turf quality goes up, uh, soil uh, total nitrogen goes down. And this is because there's excessive nitrogen. Normally you'd have a positive relationship between soil nitrogen and turf performance. But in almost all cases, uh, in this 20, this is like application of a pound per thousand. So the best performance was when the, uh, there's like a pound per thousand, which is more than any normal application you know, people would put on uh, in a steady. I mean, this is like, that's a pound per thousand all the time, not one application that sort of bleeds down. And you're talking up uh, around five pounds per thousand where you're really starting to uh, toast the turf, which everybody knows what that looks like when you have a little bag of fertilizer spill. So uh, the nitrogen was the was really uh, a big deal. Um, leaching it out was also a big deal, trying to figure out how you could leach it out. Domestic water would help you do it. Uh, but the ultimate solution was to help uh, uh, get a more salt tolerant turf variety. Why don't you describe how this uh, process? Yeah, that was, uh, that was a picture of a, a fairway there where we actually uh, never closed the golf course. We kept the course open. We do half a fairway at a time. So we'd come in with a, with a large uh, cultivator and, and just drive right down the middle of that fairway and uh, grind up the grind up the turf into the soil. We compact it and two days later we put in, put in turf down and two weeks of grow in and then we'd come, come back and, and do the other half of the fairway. Jeff, that's a good way to get your members to be more accurate off the tee. They have to aim yeah. for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And oh, it was an opportunity to, to also uh, you know, go in and uh, shave out some high spots and uh, fill in some low spots and really, really do some good, some good fairway contouring work. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably not, not everybody can do that. But, uh, you know, we talk about varieties a lot. And uh, at, at courses that have the resources, this type of thing is, is possible. And with the success of the fairways, it was uh, in 2013, we decided to do the rough. And so we went after 80 acres of rough and resurfaced, uh, same, same type same type of program. We did the left half of the, the, the golf hole and come back in two weeks and do the right half of the golf hole. And uh, just worked our way around through 80 acres of uh, new, new Bermuda grass to remove all, yeah. all cool season turf. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the, the savings and resources is uh, phenomenal. That kind of... Um, switch and varieties and water savings inputs and all everything goes better. Well, this is what um, Mike had talked about earlier is a soil web survey. This is from, this is Big Canyon. And uh, if you did look at the, the previous, I guess, episode 38, there is a model that you can use. You can run on uh, that system, uh, which is called the soil rutting model. And it was developed uh, primarily for forest service to determine whether or not uh, soil structure would fail 
uh, after rainfall when they're trying to get equipment through um, into the into the forest to harvest wood and that type of thing. And what it does is it shows you where you're likely to have uh, problems with cart traffic. And uh, I think Jeff, they said this is pretty much matches where your areas you have problems when it when you try to Co irrigate. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that, that Myford loam is a uh, is, is pretty good quality um, soil in the upper upper regions of the course. Right up here. Yeah. Yep. That little strips of stuff that's okay, and then the bulk of the area is pretty tough to manage. So that gives you an idea of where you're gonna where the problems are gonna show up. These things are good for pitching uh, sand top dredging programs to organizations also. And then you can look a little bit more deeply uh, into the, the physics of the system. And we're looking at saturated paste, I'm not saying <laughs> saturated hydraulic conductivity. And uh, this the primary soil there is a clay loam, Anaheim clay loam, and it's doing about 1.4 micrometers per second. That's about uh, 0.2 inches per hour. Uh, so it's in the low end, it, it pretty much shows what's going on. The other problem is the uh, plant available water is only 0.15 uh, uh, inches per inch of water. So if you had a 0.25 inch ETO day for three days, you'd need five inch of roots to, uh, to survive those three days. And you're probably not going to get that with a, with a cool season grass. Bermuda can uh, pretty well tolerate that uh, pretty good. So that gives you, you can get some pretty good information just looking at these reports. I find them useful when I'm going into a site that I don't know much about. Uh, get a little bit of background so you can get an idea what's going on. Or even on uh, uh, Twitter, when we hear uh, people uh, conversing back and forth, sometimes you can go in and take a look at uh, what's going on and uh, maybe provide some advice. And this this is <laughs> the example of those two types of soils, two major types oh, there, of soils. There, there, there you go, there it is. <laughs> right. And just look at the sand, look at the turf quality on top of the the more sandy soil compared to the, the clay loam on the right side. It's pretty, pretty rough. There's not much you can do with that other than to slowly uh, build a, a surface on top that you can drive a cart on and get equipment on. I mean, you can't, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you can make it, you can put enough water on it to make the grass look good, but then your balls are going to plug and you, you can't, and that, that was really a, that was really a challenge with the membership was being able to communicate that to them and you know obviously we did some of these studies up front and and, and tried our best to you know come up with management plans that would put this off or, or at least make the, the course more playable but uh, at the end of the day it, it just it, it became too too difficult to manage and having to, to, to resurface with uh with the Bermuda grass was was the best right. way to go but it was it was a tough communication with, with the membership yeah, we contracted with uh, Dale Devitt at the uh, University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, to do a pretty comprehensive study. We pulled soils down to about six feet and looked at uh, distribution of the salt profile. And with that information, uh, he was able to estimate you need about a 15% leaching fraction to keep the salts in the top, you know, four to six inches in the tolerance of the turf grass. The problem was that you can do that but then you can't walk on the you can't walk on the surface. So the the thing that's missing in the whole analysis of uh, moving salts, like in ag systems, those types of things, is is that the the unique character of golf courses where you have to step on it. I mean, of course you have to harvest some soils, but uh, with where you irrigate, but you can leach them down and then you can wait and can plan your harvesting equipment to go through the fields after they firm up. But with golf, it's like a, it's all the time. So you you can't have a you can't just shut down for two weeks and let the Fairways right. dry down, so you had to do something different, which is the, the top dressing programs. All right, I was going to put. Uh, let's see. Um, do, are, do you have any questions yet, John? Anybody got any concerns out there? Okay, <laughs> we do. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself, but I couldn't. Uh, somebody had a question. I think it was for. Um, Jeff, and they asked, uh, I think it's uh, the person from Portugal, asked what kind of um, treatment did the water, the recycled water that you received in your course get? And it said specifically, did you treat the water once you received it against bacteria or anything? I don't know what needs to happen with that water um, when it comes in and how Yeah, it, the, 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 the water was fully treated. It's a tertiary treatment uh, plant in, uh, in Fountain Valley um, that, that's fully, fully treated. So the water comes in, right up through my sprinkler head. So we, do, we don't at all um, 
it, it is fully treated. So from a water quality standpoint, it is a higher quality water than, than a lot of the water in Southern California. Um, the, the salt, the salt load, you know, a third of what some of the San Diego courses have to deal with. So I was, was pleased with that aspect, but the nitrates really were the, were the biggest issue. Good. Right. I think, did you have, do you have to restrict that um, contact with the water? Well, we, we did. We, we, we had to remove uh, water fountains, um, put in, uh, you know, obviously black flow devices, but uh, connections along homeowners, along the streams, along the creeks, all had to be potable water. There was an extensive study by the state and uh, the county water um, agencies to, to look at where, where this water was going to go. There's a downstream from the Gulf is a sensitive back bay, um, the upper Newport back bay ecological so anything that comes off the course goes into there so there was a lot of concern that we're going to you know add extra salt which i was like curious why that was a problem it's going into the ocean water but um uh yeah so we, we did quite a bit of uh, work to, to to augment the system to to prevent that runoff to, to going off the golf course well i think and and mike want to might want to comment on this uh the trend is in the areas that are aired like we are in during um mega droughts which there's some discussion we might be in that type of thing, uh, is that recycled water is now going to be, uh, yeah, one, I don't know what they call it now. It's not it's clean water or something, but it's toilet to tap concept. So recycled water is no longer going to be recycled water. It's just going to all be water because it's all going to get mixed together, probably in underground storage uh, areas. I think Mike, you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, it's it's going to change a bit from the standpoint of there are water districts that are looking at taking it from what we have tertiary water is for unrestricted irrigation purposes where you have a golf course isn't fenced off. If you want to use secondary treated, you'd have to have like a park or something that's fenced at night. But taking a level beyond tertiary, they call advanced treatment where they do charcoal filtration, reverse osmosis and then blend it back in with drinking water sources and things like that. They're looking at all the waters having the same value. So where we used to get at least a 20% discount, now it's getting down to 15 and only 10% discount to take the recycled water over potable water. And they're just looking at different ways to utilize it on a larger scale. In fact, there was just an article posted by uh, uh, UC Riverside was doing a I can't remember who was doing the study economic or something study, but they, they were looking at through the drought and some of the things that I think Larry, you probably saw, I know I did with some of the courses around here that the uh, everyone doing indoor conservation led to a 10 to 20% reduction in sewer flows, which led to a increase of salinity in the recycled water. And uh, so that was uh, kind of the law of unintended consequences with all the conservation going on and uh, they're going to have to deal with that on top of everything too because when you start doing reverse osmosis it, uh, the cost of doing so is really predicated on how much salinity you have in the water and how much you're trying to remove from the water so yeah I think one of the things that came up you know you know 25 years ago or whatever it, it's the soil physics really um, plays a huge role in the success of uh, any of these systems and if you're on a sandy soil you got a chance um yeah. I mean, on these clay soils it's a this just a lot more more difficult um, and, and it's it's really kind of odd i mean some of our best recycled water quality at least in southern california is out in the palm desert area they've got very low salinity recycled water compared to our coastal areas in south orange county and down into san diego and the soils are you know sandy out in the desert with the good yeah. water quality and this what jeff was dealing with in in the coastal regions so uh you kind yeah, of get the double yeah. whammy Larry, yeah you have, more, you have more slides or did you have something else that you were going to show i was going to share the unshare the screen unless you had something else to show yeah I, I uh unless uh anybody wants we could um well no let's not let's not show this right now we'll if we have some more time we can get into that later so, we could go ahead I was just going to say to people, in case anybody had any uh, questions, it would be a good time to ask, and uh, we do have one coming in. Someone says, do you recommend any, any regular calcium amendment and some leaching with pure water at critical periods if you have the opportunity or in heavy soils after some aeration work? Well, <laughs> if you, yeah. It depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of a tough one. I mean, um, 
sodium uh, sodium moves pretty well. Uh, the bulk of the sodium that you're seeing in there. Um, if I let me share my scheme just real quick again. Yep. Um, Uh, when you see this type of response, um, where, oh, where's my, lost my cursor, where you, these dramatic drops in sodium, this is equivalent to the domestic water after uh, a heavy rainfall year. That really lets you know that this sodium that, that this accumulated up here, this is not on the cation exchange sites. This is not uh, really influencing um, the soil system that much and, it, and it's moving easily. If it was uh, if it was already exchanged on the cation exchange sites, you'd have a you'd have a problem there. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, let me just go up uh, a couple more. And the areas that we have that you want to watch out is uh, keep your SAR um, below six. And then even though we have these high bicarbonates, we had a bicarbonate restriction on the top there. It's the um, residual sodium carbonate, which oddly was not part of the contract, which we would probably uh, do. Uh, in future, uh, well, if you could get a contract, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> you shut that off. You're an important man. Uh, yeah. What, what's that about? Yeah. Um, so, uh, what was the point? Now I got dis distracted. Well, the, the idea of leaching oh. and amendments, and yes. and I would yeah. just comment, Larry, uh, if you got a low SAR, your soil is going to equilibrate to that, and you've got enough calcium in the water already to keep that sodium moving, in theory, providing you can leach. Right. That's the where you see the sodium accumulate with low SAR water is where you can't move anything through the soil because right. you're accumulating salt, sodium, everything that's in the water. Yeah, it's not as complicated. We, we, I was just going to say, and we judiciously used a, a verted drain on, on the fairways and, and rough areas to you know, really try to keep things open, and, and that, that definitely helped. Um, but we, we did not go down with any um, heavy gypsum application or anything like that. There was, there was plenty of calcium in the in soils. Yeah, so there, that's a whole other story sometime that we could discuss is calcium amendments. That's a whole interesting. Yes. And if yeah. you're going to apply them, apply them. It's going to rain. You have a pretty good argument there. <laughs> yeah. So, Larry, you had something else. Uh, I'll uh, let other people if they have no, questions. I'm not, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Do we have any other questions there? There's nothing yet. Um, obviously, anybody can ask a question if they want. Okay. Uh, I, I think what, one of the things that... Um, that we've talked about our, let me just, let me do a screen share again, just a little bit that um, is, is setting up drains, which I think, uh, oh, we don't have a whiteboard on this one, huh? Uh, I don't know if there's one or not. Yeah, I don't know. I, I thought that when you go into, um, oh, wait, here's an advanced, let's see what the advanced says. It may not, uh, I think uh, that it's like- no, it doesn't. Uh, But let me, uh, well, okay. I was just gonna say, when you're putting drains uh, in, in fairways like the ones that Mike sh had shown also, uh, there's, you gotta consider the depth of the sand that you need to have uh, the water move from the surface to the drain on the bottom. And that's gonna be a function of the type of sands that you're using. And I had, I'll just do this one this week. <laughs> it's always kind of fun with a, uh, I got a SpongeBob for the demo and uh, I'll try not to make too much of a mess here because it's embarrassing but uh, sands this kind of like sponges uh, that they're going to drain as a function of the uh, the depth of water the amount of water pulling suction on the capillary system in the soil so it, it comes into equilibrium at, at this depth here and if we wanted it to be drier at the surface then we'd make the sand deeper you can see more more water is draining out. So the suction, it's the physical mass of the water pulling air into the top and draining out the bottom. So that's a real critical issue that if you want to have about 15% soil moisture at the top uh, or and like 15% uh, air filled spaces, which is good for turf, that's what you do. So you'd, you'd have to adjust, you know, the um, the depth of the sand based on the characteristics of the sand. So it's kind of a simple, that's a simple ex a look at the way that works. And then if I do share- I feel, I mean, I feel like I'm in Dr. McNitt's class. <laughs> <laughs> if we go back, I, I brought some data just to uh, 
I, I was going to add, Larry, that it's kind of similar to looking at hydraulic head in, in uh, an irrigation application. The height and the weight of the water uh, yeah. in relationship to the pore size uh, is what's going to regulate that uh, right. drainage. Exactly. And this is the type of test that they do with the with USGA spec greens, looking at 30 centimeters being 12 inches. And when the, uh, they do this by using pressure plates, so they uh, put the saturated sand in and then they increase the pressure and then calculate the amount of uh, uh, pore spaces. So you have blue is the capillary pore space and uh, red is the air-filled pore spaces. And you can get, if you can get about 15% of both of those, you're, you're okay at 30 inches. So this one does not have enough air-filled pore spaces and it's got, two, you know, it's got kind of high capillary pore spaces. Uh, so it gives you a rough idea of what would be uh, involved. And then you want to have at least like 15% water holding there. So it's not that far off. And this is just looking at it. This was a, uh, one of the possible capping sands that was uh, uh, tested in a project that I was involved with. I'll try to get it to advance the slide. Larry, I'm going to ask you, were you looking for something that was similar to a greens construction mix in the... No, we're looking for, we're looking for a, a, a price in the depth. Okay. So I'll show you that in a second. Okay. So this shows you another, uh, another one of the sands that uh, you had a better, better, the curves actually crossed, which is typical for a, a better uh, uh, type of a sand. Uh, capillary pores down at 10% at 30 inches, at 30 centimeters, you know, and airfield pore spaces at 33. So it's kind of a droughty one. So if you come up here at 30, look, it didn't have any, hardly any water holding capacity. So this one, uh, like if you're looking at a greens mix, it would be too droughty. But our goal, this shows you what the goal is, what we we're looking at, was to find the sand uh, that the price and the depth. So what we did is we fixed the air filled pore spaces at 12%, so a little bit lower than what would be ideal. And then we wanted to have uh, at least 15% water uh, filled capacity. So it have some water holding capacity and then compare that to the depth that the sand uh, would be required to produce those characteristics of, you know, 12%, uh, you know, at least at least 12% airfield, and then uh, as good as we can do on the water holding capacity. Right. So you can see there's a series of sands here. Uh, one only be, this only need to be applied at six inches. This one is 4.7. I don't think you'd ever apply anything at 4.7 inches. That was that Pro Tour, which is almost- Yeah, uh, it's expensive. Yep. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's as expensive and you, you wouldn't, uh, you couldn't do it anyway. And it would have to be super thin. So just actually trying to get the product on would be difficult. I can't remember which one we might've went with. I think it might've been this uh, um, all purpose. Plus you got the, uh, you know, hydraulic conductivity was good. Oh yeah, boy, my finger's going off. And you don't, you certainly don't want something that's got a bulk density like this thing, 1.81. That's like a plaster sand. I think that was the first sand that I showed. But if you're going to put in a, you know, a drain, and you want to put, you wanted to sand fill the area over the drain, you would have, this would help you decide how deep you're going to put the drain. So you'd want it to be, to match uh, the sand that you're going to fill in the top to make sure that it drains enough and, and keeps the uh, air filled uh, pores at the surface adequate for root growth. I, you're ab absolutely right. We, we, we had that experience on a couple of T-tops. We, we put in a four inch sand cap and, with washed plaster sand and, and it just, it was just holding water and holding water and, and until we stripped it off and went to six inches deep, boy, it, it really performed much better at that, at that point, but that was a... Yeah, and then little, you don't, then, yeah, and then you don't want to make them too deep either. I mean, because then you just suck all the water. It's like this Pro Tour. Yeah, you put the Pro Tour yeah. in there at six inches and you'd be sucking it dry on the top. You'd never be able to make it. Uh, That's always a concern I have is that you go out there with a the sand that doesn't hold enough water and now you've got 35 acres of putting greens that you've got to treat yeah. with wetting agent and whatever else and hand watering and to keep it just moves the it. problem it just moves yeah the problem. exactly it just expands the problem to a new problem from what you had before so i've always yeah. been well you know if you got a little bit of a dirty sand that holds a little water it's probably not gonna be the worst thing in the world as long as it still drains right and well there's nice things there's these analytical methods that you can use to help guide you you know balancing uh price you know the cost you know because i mean delivery costs so if you're going to go six point uh, five inches versus 5.9 actually that's a lot of material over a whole golf course yeah you know? so you can you can get some different pricing changes that uh, will make a difference it might, might even be the shipping costs that are that'll make that'll drive the decision but as long as you've got a comparable qualities of sands that are going to provide what you need and i think i think um if this thing's going to advance wow i think we just wanted to wrap up uh, with what mike was saying that 
uh, it doesn't matter what your water source is, whether it's recycled, domestic, uh, well water, it's the, it's the chemical composition of the water that you're interested in, not the source. So just because someone says it's recycled doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. And then this, this last thing, that the, uh, these water quality um, evaluations are available, are available to use. And if you need to talk to somebody, you can talk to Mike or myself. We can help you out on some of those. Make issues. one comment that when you're sending a sample off to the lab and it's recycled water or any kind of wastewater, you have to request a lot of times ammonium be sampled. They don't always do that automatically because you don't find ammonium in natural water sources like streams and lakes and things like that. The aeration converts it to nitrate. And so typically your labs will just test for nitrate unless you request ammonium or classify it as a wastewater sample. So uh, that can throw you a curveball, like you guys ran into where you didn't recognize the ammonium was so high initially because they weren't may not have been reporting it until right. you asked for it. Right. That's, so. yeah, that's exactly right. Well, you looked at the soil situation and then immediately said, okay. <laughs> Something else going on. <laughs> we, we, we do have a question uh, going back to salinity. And I don't know, maybe Larry, it's a good one for you. But um, have you found any level of salinity in the water or soil where salts are used to control weeds and stress specifically poa annua. Um, obviously, I know that in seashore past Balam, I've heard of people applying salt in, in like Asia. Um, I don't know what weeds they're going after, but nothing that you know of that's like, you know what, this is a good level and kept it out. Seems like yeah, a lot of poa grows in California. Yeah, it's just a little too hard to keep it. The, the tolerances, even though it seems like they're great, they're not that different. Uh, but what you will see is uh, drain lines covered with poa annum uh, where you, you do get there is obviously some control of poa but you can't it's like directing the control and being able to um, tighten it up is pretty difficult ditto yeah because you got to yeah. actually because the problem is poa likes to live right up in the top there and you're always you're always driving the salts down in the top little area below the tolerance of poa most of the time yeah it's like i was like I mentioned that the, the, the bulk of the salts are gonna follow the wetting front. They're gonna be down there. You're gonna have a higher concentration at the wetting front than you are right at the surface where the pole is living. So that, that's the challenge. Well, we do see, we do see high little, there can be high levels at the top with, from evaporation, evapotranspiration. We do get a little bit of, sometimes you'll see if you're pushing the soil probe through, it might be a little higher at the top and goes down a little bit, but it's not, you not just enough, can't not control, enough to control it. it where you want it. Not no, because we, we, we would see some control in, in some low-lying areas that once they dried out real well, that pole would just get smoked in those spots. But, uh, you know, the, the higher yeah. spots, pole was just, just happy. Just the, just the factor of distribution uniformity variations of your irrigation system is going to make that managing that salt level that much more impossible. Because yeah. you've got 20% variation most often out in the field from your wetter area to your drier area. So to try and manage it that precisely is. Well, and you have, you have periodic rainfall. So that knocks the salts down and then the poet germinates and then it displaces whatever else was there. Now people are, are using, you know, like seawater in some locations to uh, knock down some weeds and seashore past balance. But those are kind of unique situations, sandy soils, um, you know, uh, warm, good warm season quality environments. Uh, where a past ballum thrives, and then I think you can you can do a little of that, and you can actually uh, spot spray with some salts. But I think those are the only cases where you can really put the salts on. Yeah, that makes sense. Anybody have anything else? We don't have any other questions. Um, I think we've been about you know just shy of an hour, but um, I don't know. Every time I start listening to these talks on soil, water, and and soil maps. I'm not a soil scientist by any stretch of the imagination. So I always learn a lot. So like I'm paying attention and then I'm like, I'm going to go back and watch that section again. <laughs> I'm going to okay. see, um, try and grasp it because it's, uh, it, it gets so complicated when you start looking at all the factors. Um, and usually I'll hear people just say, you know, what we talked about, um, you know, put down gypsum or something and flush it. Like that's the solution to everything. But gypsum is another salt, John. You're just adding more salt to the mix. Right. Uh, although it's not the hottest, so to speak, salt in the world. Uh, if you don't need it, why spend the money on it? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back in my career as a superintendent very early on when I was up at the City of Industry, Industry Hills, uh, we were gun shy. We were converted to recycled water, which was a really a very high quality recycled water, about 650 parts per million TDS. And I don't recall the SAR now, but so we left one fairway untreated after we did gypsum on them all and, and then went back and soil tested and went, well, this isn't really doing anything for us to put all this gypsum out. So we, we went away from it. So, yeah, yeah. we've done quite a few trials trying to, um, trying to get a response with the uh, gypsum. We've been un unable to, so it's. And, and to get fine gypsum that will go into solution. <laughs> I guess to that too. Yeah. And well, one of the things is you, you put on, you can put on 10 pounds of gypsum, but if you've got a couple thousand parts per million calcium in the soil already, uh, you, the analytical procedures aren't accurate enough and this variation in soil sampling greatly swamps that small uh, increase in calcium that you can provide with gypsum. So if you've got, if you've got 1500 parts per million calcium in the soil, which you probably do if you have a little bit of a salt issue, uh, you should just focus on getting that out of there, the calcium and the sodium, just by leaching and the sulfates and the chlorides. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find gypsum is more beneficial in situations where you've got not enough salinity in the water. Yes, and no, not really too much, yeah. and that blows people's minds to hear that. I remember telling a greens committee one time, "Your water is too pure," and they looked at me like I was from outer space. But uh, it really does make a difference if you're in one of those localized areas where you've got ultra low salinity in the water of less than a. I've seen a, a 0.07 uh, EC. Right uh, on occasions, and it's nuts. Yeah, once the once EC starts to drop below 0.5, uh, well, you guys get rainfall yeah. out there, so I don't, I don't know on the East Coast, but out here where you where you're irrigating, those low EC waters uh, really uh, damage the soils. And you have, I think you I have to inject I, gypsum. Yeah, I think I read one time, Larry, that uh, in the East where they've had a lot of rainfall, that the soils have weathered and evolved differently than what we have out here in the desert area, and our soils are much more. Uh, touchy about <laughs> low low salinity water. Yeah. So yeah. There's yeah. another question in here from Ron. He says, "How does dissolved oxygen levels in the water affect the use of reclaimed water?" Well, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, getting oxygen into water is, you know, just throwing it out at irrigation. And I think maybe you, if you're talking about storage uh, in a lake. Uh, then, then oxygen levels are going to be a, an issue. But I don't think there's a problem with uh, throwing waters out through sprinklers from research I was familiar with in like the uh, industrial fermentation industries that uh, you can get oxygen in the water pretty well. But there are some things that are interesting like ozone treatments that, that have some uh, possibilities to help with, not with so much with oxygen, but they, uh, they can get some... Um, sulfur hydrogen hydrogen sulfide smells out of water that come from wells that, that smell bad so you can you can oxidize some stuff down that way but uh, not so much as far as biology or or uh, of the soil and getting oxygen into the soil yeah there's there's a lot we don't understand about all that stuff I know the the greenhouse industry is big on dissolved oxygen in their irrigation source, but I think they're doing mostly uh, hydroponics and maybe that's more of a issue there. Uh, iron in low oxygen waters, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't oxidize until you aerate it. And that's a whole another problem in itself that uh, Glenn O'Bear uh, studied when he was at the, well, he, I don't know if he's finished his PhD now and all that, that he was doing it in Nebraska, but he started out at Wisconsin. And I've talked to him about that because I had a client in Vietnam who was getting that seasonally and uh, seemed to be clogging up some of their pore space, but not completely cementing like he was finding in a lot of examples. So there's a lot left to learn in this area if some young scientist wanted to go off and delve into it i tell you uh, i'm glad i'm not young anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, i think young. that was a good discussion we're right at about an hour um i don't see any other questions if anybody has them we can ask them but um i figured i'd give everybody one last round of a word if you wanted to say anything promote anything 
that's kind of how we used to end turf chat back in the day. Um, I'll start just because I'm going to promote turfdiseases.org. That's like the new, well, not the new, it's like turf chat. We brought that back and we're trying to consolidate and use it as a resource for people around the world to see what problems are going on in their area. And I'll promote my mobile app turf path free download that. So I'm going to go in the order I see you. So Mike, you're next. Okay. Well, I don't really have anything to promote other than if anybody's interested in uh, watching water issues and that I post every, just about everything I post on Twitter and Facebook, you can find me at either one. It's all the same stuff goes both places uh, on water and typically in the Western United States, but sometimes I'll find some things out East that are interesting uh, and golf related issues as far as uh, course management. When we had the roundup thing going on, I was posting articles about that. I, Kind of current events in the water is what my my uh twitter and and uh facebook posts are about but they can find me easy enough if they want to follow that type of stuff so okay and, uh, jeff i just want to thank you uh you larry and mike for, for involving me in this, this zoom meeting and uh it's, it's the first time for me and it's uh, very exciting so uh, thank you very much for, for including me and uh, i enjoyed it very much yeah, thanks for coming. It was awesome to have you and your perspective um, of, of how you actually did things in the field. So, Larry? Okay, all right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for uh, spending some time with us. Uh, let's remind everybody that PaceTurf.org is a membership-supported website that you can uh, get all kinds of information and um, take a look if you can. And uh, you can follow us on uh, PaceTurf on Twitter. And Larry's likes. Maybe we'll make one of those episodes one time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, everybody, I'm going to wrap up uh, episode 42. Thank you very much for everybody that came, um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.